Thank you, Pastor Wing Chi, for those very kind words of welcome and introduction. I'm delighted to be back at SIB. I've missed you for three years because of the pandemic. Now, I travel a lot, and folks always ask me, can you name 10 of the most influential churches around the world? And one of them that I mentioned in the top 10 is SIBKL. My criteria is not a mega church with thousands, thousands of people. But my criteria is how healthy is it? Is it really growing, producing disciple makers, and truly making an impact in God's world? And you have done that, and it's marvelous. Well, I'm also thrilled and delighted when a few weeks ago, I was speaking to one of your pastors, Michael Lamb, and his wife, Tabitha. They were members of my church in London. And what you have done is to turn two of our cell leaders into pastors. You've done a marvelous job. And I thank you for it. Now, very quickly, this book, Growing Leaders, one reason why you should buy it and read it is because your pastor commended it here, or in writing. <laughs> but here in this book, I really seek to inspire and motivate people to soar like eagles. And I tell people, don't be ducks. Ducks always quack. <laughs> and there are a lot of pastors who like to be among ducks because when he say something, everybody say quack, 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 we agree. That church doesn't grow. But if you can lift people up to the heights and where they see God's panoramic view and plan and begin to work towards it, then it's worth it. Now, in my book, I mentioned many people who have influenced me and people that I have touched. You may not believe it because some of the people who are prime ministers, presidents of country, I have an indirect influence on them. My colleagues or myself, we've been able to encourage them to be men of God, women of God, even before they graduated from university. Now, by upbringing, I'm an Anglican. And one of my desires when I went to the theological college in England was to become one day the bishop of Singapore. But I never went into the Anglican church as a minister because God had other plans. Then as I look back at my life, I said, God, you're wonderful. You didn't allow me to become a bishop, weighed down by all kinds of traditions and responsibilities, but you have helped me to raise up three archbishops and at least five or six bishops around the world. So because God has been so good to me, not because I'm a very clever or able man, but God's grace and following him. So I share my experiences in this book, Growing Leaders. It only costs $40 or 40 ringgit. And if you are fast enough, uh, first 20 people or so, I throw in a set of DVDs on leaving a legacy. That's for you free in this book. But don't fight if you uh, are going to buy this book, okay? Now, this is hot of the press. Three days ago, it came out of a printing shop in KL. And this is a, a booklet that I have compiled called Journeying Together. It talks about our journey, walking upwards with God, inward with ourselves, and also around, outwards, with people that we relate with, that people who will touch our lives and we can impact them. And these are quotes not only from the Bible, but from politicians, philosophers, scientists, even for people who may not have Christian value, like Madonna, I quoted her, but with a big, big warning, okay? It doesn't mean I endorse what she said. There are all kinds of quotes. And um, what you can do is to read one for yourself, keep it for a week, because as you look into what is being said by these great men, for example, a man like Augustine, church father in the fifth century, he says, um, without God, we cannot. Without us, he will not. When you think about that, that's very, very profound. And I'm delighted with people like Einstein who says, don't be a man of success, be a man of value. And then again, a very well-known basketball coach called John Wooden have said to them, don't seek reputation. Reputation is what people think of you. Reputation goes, but go for character that always remains. So if you quote these things to your spouse or to your cell group members and so on, and you begin to read it, or even to seeker friends, and you say, hey, which quote resonates with you? You can begin to share. And then God will lead you to very fruitful conversation. 
either for healthy growing uh, with fellow believers or leading other people to come nearer to God. Now, both books, Growing Leader and uh, Journeying Together, are available, uh, and you can find them at the book table after the service. Today, I'm going to preach on this topic, Growing God's Way. It resonates with your church vision to go to grow generations. So God has guided me to this theme, and I didn't know that you had that motto or slogan for your church. Now, all New Year's are milestones, whether it be January the 1st or in a two weeks' time, Chinese New Year. In Chinese New Year, Chinese believe that on Chinese New Year, everyone is a, day, a year older. Now, of course, those of us who are above 50 would say, oh dear, how terrible, one year older, I don't like that. Is there a culture, is there a race where when the new year comes, I'm one year younger? <laughs> I can't find that. If you can, please let me know. But we find in Scripture that God's desire for His people, for His beloved children, is that they grow. They grow. And therefore, I've chosen as my text, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, You find it on the screen. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wonderful words from Peter. He was speaking at a time when there were all kinds of dangers, false teaching and false prophets and teachers. He said, look, concentrate on one thing. You are to grow. How? In grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. But growth, Christian growth, is not magical. How many of you heard the story of Jack and the beanstalk? You remember Jack? His uh, widowed mother gave him a cow, the family cow to sell. And then he met a woman who said, look, uh, I will buy your cow for one bean. And this bean is a magic bean. You plant it, it will grow into a giant tree. And Jack foolishly <laughs> did an exchange. And he put the bean in his garden. Next morning when he went there, this Bean became a tree that reached to the very heaven. Now, this is fictional, a fairy tale. Christian growth is not like that. It's not magical. Because there are many Christians who say, if only I have the right formula, if only I follow the right preacher and teacher, if only I have this encounter, this experience of God, then bingo, I'm going to be a mighty giant tree. That's not biblical or Christian growth. Growth is something day by day. Now, a man called Robert Holden has written a book and he asked a question. Are you just going through life or growing through life? Who are you? Which are you? Just simply going week by week, month by month, year by year, or are you really growing to be a spiritual giant, to be like an eagle soaring in the heights, doing the will of God? So that's a challenge. Are we growing or are we simply going? Now, why grow? And here is God's will for every believer. Can we have the next slide? Yes. God's will is that we grow more and more to be like Jesus, growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And in Romans 8, God's will. Lots of people are saying, I want to know God's will. And sometimes I say to them, it's very clear in the Bible. Is it clear? Of course it is. Romans 8, 29. Because God chose us, He predestined us. And the Greek word horizo means there's a horizon that God sees. He wants us to grow, to grow, to be like His Son, Jesus Christ, to be conformed to the image of His dear Son. And Paul writing to the Christians in Ephesus and Asia Minor, he said to them, look, don't be like little children being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Don't be like that. Don't be childish. Grow up. Grow into maturity. That is the biblical plan and that is the will of God. But then we must be careful because uh, how do we measure growth? As year succeeds year, are we really growing? Or are we always maintaining our status quo, never reaching the heights that we're meant to reach, always being stagnant Christians and never growing, or are we becoming more and more like Him? So, the question is, 
how do you measure growth? And the simple answer is, when people see that you're becoming more and more like Jesus, having His grace, the way that He treats people, giving people second chances, loving them, accepting them, and always desiring their welfare, then you are growing. Now, some years ago, when I stepped down as pastor of Emmanuel Church in London, I was consultant for a church in Hong Kong, Union Church. And I preached at the 945 service. I had on the clerical robes. And uh, as I was standing at the back of the church greeting people, I saw a man, Chinese guy, very tall, American-born Chinese, with a three-year-old boy who was carrying him. And then, before he reached me, maybe about seven or eight feet away, this boy suddenly shouted, pointing at me, Daddy, Daddy, is he Jesus? And I was so embarrassed. I said, no, 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 I'm not Jesus. And the father said, no, no, son, he's not Jesus. And we both blushed. I'm not sure whose face was redder. But when he came near me, just about three feet away, he turned to me, this, this little boy, and he said to me, are you Jesus? And again, I said, no, help, no, I'm not Jesus. But many years later, I was asking myself, why did I answer that way? I should be like Jesus, because that's God's plan for me. Maybe I will not be looking like the physical Jesus. That's impossible. But in terms of character, then I began to wonder, I should have asked the boy, why did you ask me that question? Was it the previous Sunday I played with him and uh, showed some kind of kindness, love to him? I don't know. Or was it simply because I was wearing clerical robes that reminded him of Jesus? I don't know. I wish I had asked. And I tell people, wherever I go, to my own congregation and to others, another fairy tale, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Remember the story? The wicked stepmother, what does she do? She goes before the mirror, and she would say, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? And the answer she didn't want to hear was Snow White. And she got mad with the mirror and tried to smash it. And I would say, okay, if you are a believer, you want to test whether you're growing, do this. Will you do this when you get home or tomorrow morning? Look at the mirror. You do every day because you want to see how you look. Ask this question. I do it myself. I asked the mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall. Do I look like Jesus at all? <laughs> and I remember preaching in my church. I said, look, some of you are married here. Uh, if you're a wife, you're a husband, ask your spouse, darling, darling, look at me. Am I becoming more like Jesus? <laughs> Ooh, that can be a revelation. But you know how people try it? At first, they were so shy, so embarrassed about it. But when they tried, they begin to see some good points in the other. And they would say, yes, sweetheart, you are growing to be more like Jesus. Thank you. I think in the church, to measure growth is to see the beauty, the love, kindness of Jesus in our lives. Then we move on, look at God's way of growing. God's way of growing. Now, there's one problem coming to churches, even a church like SIBKL. Why? Because whenever the preacher expounds God's word, he said, look, you should be Christ-like, you should be growing, you should pray more, you should study the Bible and be a man and a woman of the word. All very correct, all very, very good. And then the poor people who are listening say, ah, I want to do that, I want to do that, amen, amen. And then they find they just can't do it. They make New Year resolutions, only to find out, a few weeks later, they have broken all these resolutions. So they got fed up with themselves. They're pretty uh, depressed. They said, no, no, no more. So sometimes, unconsciously, we can ask people to do giant leaps, to take quantum leaps. They can't. We can't. But you know, God is a very good God. He asks us to take small steps. Some years ago, I was friendly with a theologian in Singapore, uh, Dr. Koyama. Japanese guy, and uh, he wrote a book called Buffalo Theology. And you know, he says this, God walks with us at our speed, three miles an hour, Buffalo Theology. God walks with us slowly. He doesn't want to run off, sprint like Hussein Bolt. That's not his purpose. But he wants us really to walk with him, step by step, but always going forward in his company. That's God's purpose, small steps. Now, having been a preacher for over 60 years, 
I began to realize that it's no good asking people to do giant lips because they can't and I can't. I don't want people to be disappointed. But the secret is this. If you do certain things simply, daily, and even if you forget to do something daily, don't say, I give up, do it again, something will happen. So here's my testimony. Five years ago, roughly five years ago, as I tried to measure my life before God, I said, Lord, really, I'm not growing Christ-like. I tell people to be like Jesus, but I don't see that in me. What should I be doing? You know, God sometimes says, Mr. Preacher, do what you tell people. So I begin to say, yes, Lord, but what do you want me to tell people and tell myself? He says three or four very simple things. The first one is to be thankful. Be thankful. I love the Malaysian way of saying thank you. When I came back, when they say thank you, Malaysians put their hands to their heart. Thank you. Wow, I was very touched when I see this. And you know, thanking God, thanking God is vital because in the scriptures, we're asked to enter his gates with thanksgiving and courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So here's this great song where we are encouraged to praise God together, to thank him for who he is, the great God, to say our se se or trimakasi or dankeshon, mercy to God. So this is something vital, but to do it continually. Now, my wife and I have been married for 60 years. We just celebrated our wedding, uh, diamond wedding anniversary. Thank you. Sometimes, if you live with your wife or husband for a long time, you can get very grumpy because they don't live up to your expectation. So I am one of those who's very guilty, confess, okay, that I don't always treasure her. But God says, be thankful. So when I wake up in the morning, see her still in bed there, I begin to thank God for her. Lord, thank you that uh, you even allow King Ling to marry me <laughs> and help me to be the person you want to be. Thank you. Thank you that she cleans the clothes and does so many things for me. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when you start thanking God for your wife, for your husband, you find that you can love her more. Instead of complaining and finding out all kinds of faults with your spouse, you begin to treasure them. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And then when you thank God for other people, just like... Uh, Paul would be thanking people. I thank my God every time I remember you in my prayers for you. I always pray with joy. He was very thankful for the Philippian Christians and for others. And in Ephesians, he writes, always give thanks to God for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever circumstances you might go through, good times or dark times, joyful times or times of failure and depression and doubt, Learn to give thanks because through those dark processes, the dark nights of the soul, God is going to lead you like through a tunnel to light. You will have a very interesting experience of God, His grace, seeing you through things. So learn to give thanks in all circumstances. And again, brothers and sisters, every day. Not once in a while when you got promotion or when something wonderful happened to you or to your family. No, every day to learn to give thanks. Now, some of us here, maybe suffering from some kind of disability or sickness. And my wife and I, we've been learning something about thanking God for our bodies. So, for example, my left uh, leg near the knee was very painful a couple of days ago. And instead of saying, why? And saying, ah, yeah, when I was much younger, I was so agile, I could do this, I could jump, I could uh, run, and so on. I would say, to my leg, leg, thank you for supporting me all these 80 years. You've been so wonderful. I bless you in Jesus' name. See, a lot of people, when they can't walk or something goes wrong with them, I am so, you know, they're terrible. You mustn't say that. <laughs> but you know what I mean? <laughs> I yeah, so bad and so on. We don't do that. If you do that, you are cursing. You are cursing. And that's why you don't get better. You get worse. And that's why when you pray for healing, you don't get healed. But if you say to your leg or to your tennis elbow, whatever it is, hey, thank you for supporting me all these years, and I bless you in Jesus' name. You teach, you do that every day. You find that you become a healthy Christian physically. You can ask Dr. Chu 
Yeah. <laughs> and when you start thanking people, you find God's love flowing into your lives and through you to other people. Always be thankful. So can I ask you to repeat, what is the first thing we should do every day? Be? Be? Thankful. thankful. Amen. And the second thing, be blessing. Be blessing. Now, it's very important to understand that you and I are children of Abraham. Abraham is the father of faith. You remember when God called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees, wanted to start a new race uh, through him? What did God say to Abraham? I will make you, make you, Abraham, into a great nation. One day, great nation. And I will bless you. Because all of us need the blessing of Almighty God. And I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. Can you see God's purpose? You, Abraham, will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And all the peoples of earth will be blessed to you. Or through your seed, through your descendant. And we know through Isaac and later on through Jesus Christ, through your seed, all the nations will be blessed. So this is God's panoramic plan. That because he pours his love, his blessing on us, we who receive the inflow, that should result in an outflow where we not only bless God, bless ourselves, but we also bless other people. And this is very important because when you start blessing, your life changes and you can grow to be more and more like Jesus. Once I was preaching in Canada with Tony Campolo. He's a very well-known Italian preacher. And he was telling a story about his boyhood. He says, in the road where we live in Philadelphia, there were a row of houses and there were three boys who went to school together in a school bus. In America, the school bus comes and picks you up from your home. So this bus would come, and the first house at the bus stop is a Chinese house. And every time the boy uh, goes to the uh, bus, the mother will run after him and say, son, son, have you got your books? Have you got all your papers? See, Chinese education, very important. So he goes up. And then he goes to Tony's house. Tony is Italian. You know, Italian who likes pasta and ravioli and so on. And you know what the mother would say? Tony, Tony, have you got your lunch? Have you brought your pasta, your ravioli, and so on with you? So for the Italian, growing to be a fat boy was very important, okay? The last house was a Jewish house. And then when this Jewish boy was about to climb up the bus, the mother goes to him and says, Benjamin, Benjamin, have you received your blessing? And then if not, he says, come back, son. Blesses the boy, he goes in. That's why the Jews are so intelligent and so able people, yeah? Because they know how to bless. See, this is value. So we as Christians, we must learn to bless other people. Once I was preaching on blessing in, in Hong Kong to a very big Chinese church, Tong Fok, and this is the church that has the son, Jesus is Lord, uh, plastered in 20-story buildings. And an elder was listening to me. I talked about blessing and so on. He had a son, I didn't know. A son about what, 11 years old, 10, 11 years old. He doesn't want to go to school. So this father would scold him, would try to lecture him, son, if you don't do this one day, you will have no jobs, nobody will love you, you can't marry anybody nice, and so on. You know, all kinds of things that Chinese fathers would say to their son to try to, quote, motivate them. Because his son didn't bother with that. He doesn't want to go. And they have big fights, and they had to push him into the, uh, uh, the minibus to get him to school. And when he heard my sermon, I said, look, if you have children who are very difficult, instead of nagging them, scolding them, and passing on your conviction and philosophy to them, start blessing them. At night, go to their rooms when they're asleep, just bless them. Bless them. So this elder tried to do that. He said, son, I'm sorry, you know, to scold you, to nag you, and so on. But God loves you, and I love you. I really want to, you to bless you, that you'll be the best person possible for God. All his gifts in you can be displayed properly one day. Start blessing him, blessing him. And within days, this boy was so willing. He would say to the father, Father, you forgot to bless me. I want to go to school now. Come. You see the change when you start blessing. Are you having a difficult relationship in your office, in your home? Instead of nagging, scolding, and be the number one tough guy, start blessing. Start blessing. So be thankful, be blessing. And the next thing is be encouraging. 
be encouraging. Encouraging and blessing are almost like two sides of the same coin, blessing and encouraging. Now, when we encourage somebody, it means we come alongside that person, as the Greek word uh, intends the meaning to be, come alongside somebody to lift somebody up when they are down, to say to them, I'm your friend, I'm with you. Whatever you go through in joy or in sorrow, I'm there with you. I'll rejoice with you and I also will cry with you to encourage them. You see, our world, the world of politics, the world of business, full of critics, full of negative people, full of uh, people who are running down other people. But encouraging others is a breath of fresh air, a stream in the desert where people feel wanted, love, and have a new sense of dignity. So in the Scriptures, we are told, therefore, 1 Thessalonians 5, encourage one another and what? Build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So I tell people, I'm telling you now, bless just one person a day. Just one person, not difficult. Don't bless the whole world. Don't bless PJ. You can't do that. That's silly. Let's bless one person. You don't know who to bless? Ask God. And you'll be very surprised of the names he drops into your head. I do that. And then God said, well, do you remember so-and-so? And I said, yes, Lord. It's 8 o'clock now, I, uh, but what do I do? Send him an email. And then I would say to people, okay, if you have bought this book, uh, Journeying Together, send them a quote. Uh, I like this quote, and I want to share it with you. You get the idea? We have to be practical. So when we start encouraging people, they are strengthened and they are helped to grow in Jesus Christ. Encouragement is vital. And let's go on because uh, in Hebrews, the writer says, let us consider, let's proactively consider how we can spur one another to what? To love and good deeds. What can I do for someone today that will make the world different to him or to her? Spur one another to love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more when you see the day approaching, the day of Christ's return, coming back. Start encouraging. Start building up one another. And what I love to do when I go to church, and normally I don't preach because I've stepped down from preaching in my own church, I would ask God, just show me one person that I can say a kind word to, a word of encouragement. Because as you grow older, the words you utter are weightier. So I would say to somebody, you know, God loves you. Now, some months ago, there was a, a guy who used to help Iraqi uh, people, Chris, uh, Christians who were suffering persecution and so on. He worked so hard and he got doctors, dentists, educators, businessmen to help this very poor community in Iraq. And... Um, he had lunch with me in London because I knew him uh, when I was in, Can uh, in California. And we were just talking together. And I know that this guy had gone through a very rough time because he not only met with successes but also with lots of disappointments, failures and so on. So I said to him, brother, I got a word for you. Really? What is it? Because God did give me a message for him when we had lunch. I said, my dear brother, God says, thank you. You know what happened? The guy started crying. 50-year-old man cried and cried and cried in a restaurant. First, I felt very embarrassed because this guy apparently was not encouraged by lots of people. But just a simple word from the Lord. I thought it was a very simple message. Not a longer message, Lord. No, no. Thank you. You see, a timely word, encouragement. Now, I do that, especially... I tell people, and I told the church in Hong Kong, you do it every day. Get your people to encourage others, especially seekers, those who are not Christians, and do something that they will uh, feel good about, be lifted in their spirits. So I go to my supermarket, Waitrose, which is near my house in London, very upmarket uh, supermarket, and um, I would just smile at them and thank cashiers whenever they serve me. I never told them, hey, have you heard of John 3.16? Uh, do you want to be saved? I didn't tell them I was a pastor, never. I just thanked them, smiled at them. I said, oh, you've got a tough day. I just admire the way you're so patient with us customers. I do it frequently. 
you know what? Three years ago, I went to the same supermarket and I bought a joint of lamb. It was uh, reduced by about 40%, real bargain. It was something like in ringgit, just over 100 ringgit. I was buying this joint. Then as I approached this lady, name is uh, Jane, um, she said to me, this joint is on the house, a gift for waitress. So I said, what? What have I done? He says, we notice that you have been very kind to our staff. They call their staff partners. Be kind to our partners. And, and in our supermarket, we have a policy to say thank you to people who are kind and good. So I got this joint of lamb. Later on, I got many other things too from the same <laughs> supermarket. <laughs> Free of charge. Can you believe it? So I told this story to my congregation. You know, I, same as I told you. And... Uh, they got a bit thrilled and excited. So guess what happened? They all went to Waitrose. <laughs> but they got nothing. <laughs> and they said, Pastor, how come we got nothing? I said, no, you've got to build up friendship. You don't go to get things. You go to give. So I'm just sharing with you that there's a lot of blessing when you start giving and when you start thanking, when you start encouraging people. So I can say, you can ask my wife, she's there today, give you the liberty to do it. Uh, does your husband love you more? And uh, do you love him more? And because I learned to thank, learned to encourage, learned to bless, not only her, but other people, my sons and others as well, they really grow and become something very different. So this is day by day. Can you say day by day? day, by day. And not a once-off thing when you feel like it. And when you do that, something wonderful happens. When you practice thankfulness, blessing, encouragement, unknown to you, but known to others and to God, you become more and more like Jesus. His acceptance, His grace, His kindness, uh, His goodness, His patience would exude through you. Then, how do we do this? Because it's not so easy. Sometimes I fail. One of the things I remember that I do is to learn to be still. To be still. To make time each day in my case, at least twice a day, to be quiet before God. Now, Lord, have I thanked somebody? Have I blessed somebody? What do you want me to do? Have I hurt somebody? Should I say sorry to somebody? You know, to be still. Because all the time we are chatterboxes telling God what He should do. We're like advices to God. God doesn't need our advice. But we have to listen to Him and we have to hear what He has to say to us. Be still. And know I'm God. I'm God. I'm in charge, not you. You want the best? Listen, listen. And the anagram uh, is in the book as well. The anagram, you mix the words around. Anagram of listen is silent. It's in the stillness that you hear the still small voice of God. And it's those times also when God says, okay, this is uh, like a time out for checking, for accessing, evaluating things. And then you begin to see that God is really guiding you in a very quiet but systematic way to be more and more like His Son, Jesus Christ. And then I say to people also, when you're quiet, do something, because sometimes we can get distracted so easily. You try that, you won't be quiet, and you think, oh, what TV program is on now? Uh, what appointment have I missed? Don't do that. You, when you are still, listen to God, and then you begin to say, Lord, what do you have for me that you want me to do? I want to breathe in your Holy Spirit. So what you should do when you are there is to consciously take deep breaths. Inhale. And when I inhale, I say, that I'm inhaling the Spirit of God. And by the way, uh, the word breath, ruach in uh, Hebrew, pneumatos in Greek, same word, breath. So when I breathe in the Holy Spirit, I breathe in all the fruit of His uh, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, and self-control, and so on. I breathe this in. Thank you, Lord. I'm receiving from you. Thank you. Thank you. And then you breathe out. Now, what does breathe out mean? A long time, I puzzled, you know. I said, no, I can teach people to breathe in. I do that myself. But how do you breathe out? Exhale. What do you exhale? Then I remembered a plastic surgeon from Hong Kong. I led him to Christ. He was suffering from stage four cancer in his lungs. He's still alive today, seven years after I led him to Christ and so on. And he's going to have lunch with me when I get to Hong Kong. Um, 
And this guy said, you know, uh, be, before I met you, before I gave my life to Jesus, I went to a, a qigong, you know, a breathing master, Chinese, teaching me how to breathe, to overcome my disability and so on. And he promised me that I could even overcome cancer with deep breathing. But he said it was so hard. When he, he taught me to breathe in a certain way, oh, I felt so exhausted and completely gone. I just felt like fainting. And I said, thank you very much. I can't do it. And he didn't do it. But then the man said to him, he just said something to him. He said, look, you must also learn to breathe out. Breathe out. When you breathe out, this is a Chinese kind of philosophy, what you breathe out are things toxic, bad things. And when he said it to me, I said, hey, stop, Daniel. You helped me so much. He said, what about they help you? I said, you help me to understand about breathing in, breathing out. So when I exhale, I exhale all my frustration, my temper, you know, uh, all the things that are very selfish, uh, of the flesh, exhale. You don't want those things, toxic things remain in you. They upset you, they ruin your stomach, they ruin your health and everything else, your relationship with God especially. So be still. Breathe in the love, the joy, the peace, the wonder of God. Then breathe out everything which is unholy, impure, corrupt, and useless. So be still. So my dear friends, do you remember what we should be doing every day? Not taking giant steps, but small steps. Every day. So let's see whether you remember my sermon or not. First, be. Be. And second, be blessing. And thirdly, be what? Encouraging. And finally, be still. be still. Amen. So we want to do that. And I want to pray that God will help you, help me, because after these five years which I've done every day, I find that I'm really growing in Him. So I say thank you, Lord, for teaching me. And I want to share this with people. So will you do it? Not only for today, but every day of your life. If one day you forgot to do it, don't worry. Don't condemn yourself. Go on doing it the next day and so on. And God will bless you. Now, to end my sermon, we're all going to do something. I want all of you to be quiet for about 45 seconds, all right? And then I want you to get up from your seat and bless someone or encourage someone. Someone, maybe two people, someone you know, someone you don't know or don't know well. And you say something to them. You ask God, God, what shall I say to them? How do I bless them? How do I say something that would uh, inspire them? Lift them up. Say it to them. And, they, and then when you receive that word, then return the blessing to that person. Say something back to them. Ask God, don't be afraid. Now, if you want to be like some people who are very uh, shy, and I won't get anything, try it. Try it. You don't know. Everything has to be for the first time. So you do it, and you'll be amazed that God would give you words. Because if you get nothing, that's all right. Dear brother, sister, God bless you real good. You can say that too. So that's simple. But I want us to do that. So maybe for 45 seconds, as God has been speaking to us, His word is grow in grace, in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. We tell Him, yes, Lord, I want to be like you. And I really want to be thankful. I really want to bless other people, encourage them. I want to listen to you. Speak through me. So let's rise to our feet. Everybody stand up. Go around. You can walk around and uh, talk to two people. Remember to bless two people. One or two sentences. Don't give a sermon to them. Just bless them. Encourage them. Everybody do it. We all can do it. Everyone around. Make sure you're doing it. Very good.
And I want to conclude with a very important quote, statement from C.S. Lewis. It's so wonderful to see you all sharing, some peacefully, others joyfully. That's great. Now, C.S. Lewis said something very important. He said these words, we, you can't go back and change the beginning. Many of us said, if only I could have done this or done that so many years ago, forget it, you can't change the beginning. But he said something very astute, something very wise. But you can start where you are and change the ending. You hear that? You can start today where you are and change the ending. I want to do that to change the ending, that God will be glorified, that I and those that are encouraged will grow to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 So Pastor Chu will come Amen. and uh, bless us. I don't know about you, you know, it is the words of wisdom. You know, it's like a father seeking to us. Isn't it amazing? I don't know about you, it's such a treasure of years and years of wisdom you can know it's not even the decibels of your voice it's the decibels of your spirit that matters and you know very well that Pastor Chua has gone through so much in life and today at the beginning of this year he wants to speak a blessing over all of us so everybody say be thankful be a blessing be encouraging and what's the last one be still what's the last one be still. Absolutely. Be still and know that I am God. Amen. It's in Psalm, I think, 46. that. It's all spoken in the midst of turmoil. You read that. You read the previous verses. The waves are in turmoil. Earth is shaking. And in the midst of all that, for this year, God is saying to all of us, be still and know that I am God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Even as we close, not this evening, even as we close this service, may the favor of God be with you. Amen. The favor of God will always follow you because He's a good God and He delights to bless. Amen. Let's all stretch our hands as we close. Father God, these are hands of surrender. This is a posture that we yield and surrender and receive all that you have promised us. Yes, Lord, the blessings, the favor, the goodness, the virtue, the havil of God. Even as the woman touched the prayer, the helm of the prayer shawl of Jesus, virtue flowed out. Havil. The goodness of God flowed out because He pursued after the Lord. Even as we pursue the Lord this year, my prayer is that the havil of God, the virtue of God, will flow out to you in abundance, in big abundance, to your children, to your grandchildren, to a thousand generations. Receive it. Receive it, my friend. He's for you. And if God is for you, nobody can be against you. If God is for you, nothing can be against you. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for your words. And we take it home with us, Lord. And we want to be thankful. We want to be a channel, a conduit of blessing to many people. We want to be encouraging. And we want to be still so that we can hear the still, small voice. Thank you, Lord. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you this year. 
May the Lord turn His face towards you and your loved ones. And may the good Lord turn His countenance to every one of you and your loved ones. And always grant you His shalom. His shalom. In Jesus' precious name we pray and the God's people say aloud. Let's see if you've got a good clap offering. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Amen. Pastor Lee Chu will share tomorrow and continue on our vision casting on Taking Frontiers Part 2. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.